刻むでハモンのビート Welcome back to Debunking a Rocky Forgot. While Part 7 is almost universally beloved by the Western fanbase, it is not free from its own share of misconceptions. As a whole, people seem to pay a tiny bit more attention with Part 7, since they just got done speed reading Part 6 to get there. But there are still some things to go over, including some that warrant a heftier discussion than normal. A common question asks why Gyro is capable of seeing stands when he himself is not a stand user. This question is interesting, and it requires us to look at what it is people are referring to and when. The first stand that the duo encounters is Tomb of the Boom, a stand ability split up among the three members of the Boom Boom family. Gyro does in fact see the stand and comments on it. However, I do not think that this is a normal stand. Some stands, such as Star Platinum, are purely spiritual and are only visible to stand users. However, other stands, such as Geb, are formed out of physical objects, so they could be seen by non stand users. Tomb of the Boom fits in with the second example. We can see that the stand is actually formed using one of its abilities, magnetism. We can see in a couple different examples that the stand is actually made up of iron particles and not a traditional ghost type stand. The next stand fight would be Oyakomo Va. Some people have said that Gyro saw the bird form of this stand, but this did not happen. The bird appears one time when Oyakomo Va pours out the water behind him, but neither Gyro nor Johnny acknowledge this. Gyro does see the bomb pins created by the stand, but I believe that these are also physical objects as opposed to ghostly ones. The reason I think this is because they seem to have physical properties from the way they become slippery from the sweat of Gyro's hand. There may also be fights after this where Gyro acknowledges the presence of a stand, but at that point in the story, this issue is resolved. Gyro, in a way, does become a stand user through his temporary use of the corpse's eye and the scan ability. However, he may have been able to see stands as early as the Tomb of the Boom fight. In the extra chapter, it is said that Spin is a stepping stone to awakening a stand. This is confirmed throughout the part, with Tusk's evolutions and Gyro's eventual mastery of Spin when he gains access to Ball Breaker. It is also said that the power of Gyro's Spin increased after passing through the Devil's Palm. This would be the way for him to see stands, since the use of Spin and stands is intertwined. Some people ask how many of the characters in the story have gained stands. In the previous universe, stands were awakened by the arrow, along with your own potential awakening into one at birth or later in life. In Part 7, however, stands originate from the power of the Holy Corpse. This is quite simple. It is established early on that the Devil's Palms are formed from the power of the corpse parts. The Devil's Palms were said to move miles every day, so it is not unlikely that the characters would have passed through them. This is directly said to be what happened to some of these characters at various points. After the Oyokomo Va fight, Gyro receives a gift from his home country in the form of the zombie horse. Some people are confused as to the origins of this item. It is said that it is not a stand, so many people ask, what is it? Really, this is simply some string which has been blessed with holy power by the Neapolitan royalty. With so much energy being gained from the saint's corpse, I believe that there are other sources of holy power as well. Dr. Ferdinand references the corpse of St. Francis Xavier, and he says that it has not rotted, similar to the saint's corpse. It is possible that other saints may have some kind of holy power as well. After the Wired fight, Gyro says that long lasting kingdoms around the world are able to become so powerful because they possess the corpse of a saint. He also mentions that his home country keeps record of many different saints. In his example, the nation of Venice gained power by stealing the corpse of St. Mark. It is likely that Naples has the power of a saint as well, which was then able to bless the zombie horse. There is some confusion involving the way stands are gained from the corpse parts. Besides just passing through a devil's palm, if you absorb a piece of the corpse itself and have potential, you may gain an ability from it. Johnny gained Tusk this way by unknowingly absorbing the left arm during the Tomb of the Boom fight. Some have asked about the stand like figure that appears during the Scary Monsters fight, and the one that appeared later when Gyro used his scan ability. Some of the corpse parts have a guardian, which is the form that the stand will initially take when absorbing it. 
Tusk Act 1 is the Guardian of the Left Arm. Later on, Lucy sees the Guardian of the Head, which takes the form of an angel. And that is also what this strange figure is. It is the Guardian of the Eyes of the Corpse. Gyro only ends up using one eye, so when he is shown using Scan later, half of the Guardian appears. The other half went to Diego, and you can see it with him briefly after he obtains the eye. But there is also confusion as to how exactly Diego gained this ability. This was originally the ability of Dr. Ferdinand, however, Diego began using it later, so how does this work? Gyro says that because Diego got the eye, he was able to keep his transformation. There is another question to address, which is what happens to these stands when the corpse part is lost. During the Wired fight, Johnny loses the left arm for a moment, and was no longer able to use his ability until he got it back. After Gyro gave his eye to Lucy, he no longer had access to Scan. Diego eventually ends up losing the eye, but keeps his ability. It seems that this is based on the mastery over one's particular ability. When Johnny lost Act 1, he was still very new to using it. The same goes with Gyro, who had only gotten a small amount of use out of Scan. Diego, however, was described to have his talent of transformation kept after he gained the eye. It seems that Diego became very well accustomed to his transformation, and it became his own stand independent of the corpse part. Johnny seems to have also gotten a mastery over Tusk, which is shown to evolve as he learns more about Spin. If you have multiple corpse parts, keeping at least a small portion of one will allow you to keep your stand, even if it is not the original part you received. This is seen when Johnny is able to keep Tusk after Hot Pants allows him to keep the bottom vertebrae of the spine. Eventually, the fully assembled corpse ended up in Valentine's hands. However, at this point, Johnny had evolved Tusk to Act 3, and it became his to keep. I believe that Tusk started to represent Johnny himself starting with Act 3, which had shriveled legs, and eventually got fully functional legs along with Johnny after becoming Act 4. This design change signifies the stand now belonging to Johnny. The character Sandman has caused a large deal of confusion with his portrayal throughout the part. The first point to address is his name. Initially, he is known as Sandman but later he reveals that this is actually a bastardization of his original tribal name, which is Soundman. Some people say that this contradicts the beginning of the part, since his fellow tribesmen and sister call him Sandman. Some people propose that Soundman is actually an alternate universe version of Sandman brought in by D4C. I think that this theory is ridiculous, and there is a much simpler answer. The naming convention of Sandman vs. Soundman does not work when read in the English language. In English, the two names sound very different, and nearly impossible to mistake for the other. However, in Japanese, the two names are essentially identical due to their pronunciation. Sandman in Japanese is Sandoman. Soundman in Japanese is Sandoman. This is why this reveal is so awkward in the English translation since only in Japanese would it have to be pointed out which name is being said. The second topic involving Sandman is his stand. Many say that in his early appearance, his stand was shown to control sand, while later it became his Echoes-esque ability involving sound. The event that people are referring to is when Sandman gives his entry fee for the race, where small hands made of sand appear to get in the eyes of the attendant. However, this is still in line with what his stand does later. In a Silent Way's main ability is to construct objects out of sound. Among these constructs, he is also able to make living creatures. He attacks a wasp nest which then has writing on it, but it also sprouts arms and legs and begins moving around. Many people misremember that Sandman can make these himself, and confuse them with the sound dinosaurs he uses later with the help of Diego. During the Wrecking Ball fight, Johnny and Gyro are stuck fighting in the middle of a frozen tundra where barely any life is present. Since the proper use of spin requires you to view the golden ratio as a reference, and the ratio only occurs in nature, Gyro is stuck trying to find a way to get a more powerful throw. Eventually, he manages to see the ratio in a snowflake and win the fight. However, some people have brought up other examples of things that he could have used instead. The first is his belt buckle. During the In a Silent Way fight, Gyro told Johnny that the belt was made to be used as a reference for the ratio. 
The fact that people even consider this a possibility shows a blatant misreading of that fight. The entire purpose of the belt buckle was as a test for Johnny, to realize how to view the ratio. He specifically goes over how human creations are only imitations of the ratio, and that it only exists in nature. Next, people mention his own hands, which Gyro shows that he can form into the shape of the ratio. However, this is directly addressed during the fight, when Wekapipo damages Gyro's hands. This makes it impossible for them to fit the ratio, as shown by the broken rectangle surrounding them. And last is the other people in the area. For starters, since the ratio only exists in naturally occurring things, a person who is wearing clothes would not be able to properly have the ratio. Only an exposed body part could be used, such as the corpse parts which Gyro planned to use. Certain parts of Johnny could be used as seen with his eyes, but this was extremely limited due to the left side ataxia blocking Johnny from view, and that he would have to take his eyes off the target to look at Johnny. Probably the most well-known topic in Part 7 is the appearance change of Funny Valentine. Initially, he appears fat and short, while he starts becoming gradually taller throughout the part, and eventually very muscular. I believe I know the reason for this, but first I'll go over what other people think. Some people say that he swapped bodies with another Valentine using D4C. This is probably the most valid among the different fan theories, but I don't think it completely fits. Earlier in that scene, Valentine still looks a bit frumpy, although I guess that could be something that he hides with posture to make himself more unassuming, not unlike the difference between Clark Kent and Superman. But later on, we're shown a flashback of Valentine during the war, where he still appears to fit with his later design. Other people say that the power of the corpse transformed him, particularly the ribcage. While this is also a possibility, it's a bit of a stretch since Valentine does not have the corpse absorbed in this scene. It's actually sitting over in the adjacent room. The reason behind this change is actually laid out in an interview with Araki. After being asked about it, he jokes that Valentine worked out and then goes on to lay out his real reason. It's an art style change. This is not surprising, since we have seen many characters in the series shift through different designs, sometimes scene to scene, two of which he actually mentions in that interview. Josuke used to be more muscular than he eventually became. The characters Koichi, Tamami, and Hazamata shrank, and there are other examples as well. One of the other big debates in Part 7 is the introduction of D4C. There's a great deal of confusion surrounding the moment where Johnny is shot which is clearly the intention with the mystery setup throughout that small arc. The main point people have, however, is saying that D4C's ability was changed after this fight. What people point to is the panel explaining the ability as making two universes exist simultaneously. However, I feel that this is simply one way of explaining D4C's more established ability, rather than an entirely separate one. So I'll go over the events that transpired, and attempt to line it up with how we understand D4C to work. First though, I'll give a brief explanation of the ability. D4C is capable of accessing an infinite number of parallel worlds. Valentine moves between these by becoming caught between two objects. He is able to bring people and objects across universes. However, if two identical people or things meet each other, they will combine and be destroyed, with the exception of Valentine himself. We are first shown Johnny being shot by an unknown assailant, with people in the park nearby noticing. Upon questioning, the witnesses can't agree between the shooter being Diego, Wekapipo, or Valentine. We then see the events from Wekapipo's perspective. He is attacked by Valentine from behind a flag, and after shooting him, he is suddenly in front of the recently shot Johnny. From Diego's perspective, he was up on the roof trying to follow Valentine, when Wekapipo suddenly fires at him. Diego becomes entangled in a flag and shoots Wekapipo, only to see him nearby moments later, and the wounded Johnny in front of him. Finally, we see Valentine's perspective, where he moves around using his ability and shoots Johnny. The question of who actually shot Johnny is simple, it was Valentine, while Diego and Wekapipo were just made to believe that they shot him. But how exactly did this happen? For Wekapipo, we see him attacked from behind the flag and pinned to the floor. 
I believe that this is the moment where Weka Pipo is transported into another world. We have seen that D4C's ability not only allows Valentine to disappear between objects, but also reappear from between other objects, effectively allowing him to teleport. I believe this is how Valentine was able to position Weka Pipo in front of Johnny. He was moved into a parallel world where an alternate Johnny was there for him to shoot, and then brought back to believe he shot the base world Johnny. Diego slightly earlier is attacked by Weka Pipo while he's on the rooftop. Since this is clearly not the Weka Pipo we saw before, this must be an alternate universe version. And this would not be the only time where Valentine recruits people from other worlds. This alternate Weka Pipo attacks Diego, and he ends up wrapped in the flag. We see later that Valentine is hiding in the space between Johnny and Gyro's horses a few feet away from them. This would enable him to move the corpse of the alternate Wicca Pipo away. This is also the moment where Diego was moved to be in front of Johnny due to being under the flag. And lastly, Valentine was hiding between objects to set these situations up. He shoots Johnny and then plants witnesses from other universes in the park in an attempt to cover his tracks. To put it simply, Valentine shoots Johnny, Wicca Pipo shoots a Johnny in another world and was brought back, and Diego shoots an alternate Weka Pipo in the base world, but is made to believe he shot the actual Johnny. There is also another point which is brought up about D4C. It is stated at one point that the base world Valentine is the only one who has access to D4C, but people point to a certain panel where it appears that there are multiple D4Cs in use. However, I don't think that this is really multiple D4Cs, and instead is just an effect of D4C doing three consecutive punches. This is a technique often used by Araki to show motion in a still image. A character may be shown with multiple arms or be in multiple positions, but it's really just for effect. Another question involves the cream starter stand spray used by Hot Pants. Some people say that originally, she was required to get more flesh to use it and that this limit was removed later. Let's take a look at this. In her first appearance, she is shown absorbing more flesh from Gyro to use, and then in the final arc, she is shown doing exactly the same thing using her horse. So I really don't see where people got this idea. The other point concerning Cream Starter is the spray that Valentine eventually got his hands on. People say that since Hot Pants was dead at this point, the spray shouldn't exist. While it's true that in most cases, stands disappear after death, this would not apply here, since Valentine says that he took this spray from an alternate universe Hot Pants, who would still be alive. Others ask how it is possible for an alternate Hot Pants to have Cream Starter, when the corpse only exists in the base universe. This is a question which quite literally has infinite answers. While the immense power of the corpse only exists in the base world, there could easily be something like a stand arrow or other medium for attaining stands in other universes. This would be the way that the alternate Diego got the world, and the alternate Johnny that is briefly shown having Act 2. Some people are confused as to what exactly caused Johnny to be able to walk again after the final battle. I thought that it was made pretty clear that this is due to the power of the spin. Back in Johnny's very first appearance, he briefly stood after touching the spinning steel ball. And throughout the part, we see this happening more and more, with Johnny gaining a small amount of control over his legs after gaining Act 3. After mastering spin and getting Act 4, he's finally able to walk normally. During the final fight, an alternate Diego is brought into the base world who has the stand, The World. Some people are confused as to how when he stops time, his horse moves forward as well. This is really no different from how the world has been portrayed before, since he can just pick up the horse and move it forward. Another thing I have seen asked recently is why Johnny was affected by the spin during the final fight. After being hit with the golden rotation, Diego was able to cut off his own leg before it could spread. The severed leg touches Johnny, which causes him to be incapacitated by the spin. Some ask why this is an issue for Johnny, when he is able to use Act 3 to enter the bullet holes made by spin freely. For starters, Act 3 does not use the golden rotation. Shooting himself with Act 3 causes him to be able to access the space within the bullet holes. Since the golden ratio is the basis for an infinite rotation, the space within the hole is effectively infinite. 
However, it is not actually infinite. The only way to get a truly infinite spin is using the power of a horse. This is why Johnny was stuck and had to be saved by Steven in the end, since he's not able to reverse the rotation by himself. Some people have even asked how Johnny could be saved like this in the first place, since he's not the one riding the horse. This has never been a requirement, however, since Johnny was earlier able to access the power of his horse from being kicked by it to unlock Act 4. The final question involves the final form of Johnny's stand, Tusk Act 4. Tusk first evolved into Act 4 after Johnny used the Golden Rotation which can only be harnessed by using the power of a horse. However, some people ask how Johnny was able to later use Act 4 while on the boat, without riding his horse. This is a misunderstanding of how Act 4 works. While Act 4 was unlocked by using the perfect rotation, it has never been a requirement to be on horseback for the stand to be active. In fact, Johnny was shown using Act 4 off of his horse immediately after he got it. In short, Golden Rotation is what gave Johnny Act 4, and Act 4 is the only way for him to use it, but that does not stop him from using the stand itself for other purposes like punching. And that was every Iraqi Forgot for Part 7. Overall, these topics weren't nearly as asinine as some of the other parts, and they seem to have had very little effect on the part's reputation, unlike Part 6. While Part 8 has a large amount of things to address, I do not wish to cover it until the part is over, since the explanations for many of the plot points are still yet to be introduced. I feel like the Part 8 video will be very interesting, since the tons of things people say about Part 8 will be hilarious in hindsight. In the meantime, however, there are a couple new ideas I'd like to look into. Some people seem to think that I believe that Araki can make no mistakes, despite me saying otherwise multiple times. Now that we've gone through the first seven parts showing what wasn't forgotten, it's time to take a look at the actual mistakes Araki has made along the way. I feel like this will be a very interesting topic, since very few of the real forgots are actually brought up by people. Another idea is to go deeper on certain topics of Araki Forgot in individual videos. Often it would be easier to explain something with the freedom of a full video. It will also be easier to access, as opposed to an explanation being hidden in the middle of a part-related video. If you'd like to receive updates on new videos, or ask questions, join the Haman Beat Discord using the link in the description. You can also support the channel on Patreon, where you can receive exclusive rewards. All patrons get a role on the Discord, and can have access to the extended versions of my old music reference videos, which cannot be shown on YouTube. And for future videos, subscribe to the channel. Thank you for watching. This is the part of the video where I thank my $5 and $10 patrons. Thank you to Norden the Lich, Alex Ramirez, Raziana, Boat Girl, Nax, Insane Penguin, Anasui Hat, and Robert EO Speedwagon.